Welcome to the Global Leadership Podcast, where we go behind the scenes and unpack the stories behind some of today's most effective and dynamic leaders. I'm Lori Herman, the executive producer of the Global Leadership Summit and one of your hosts. This week on the podcast, we get the pleasure of listening to Summit host Paula Ferris interview Deb Liu, the CEO of Ancestry.com. We will get to listen as they explore Deb's story from growing up in South Carolina to working in a male-dominated field at some of the biggest companies in the world, to eventually being recruited for the role of CEO at Ancestry.com. You'll also hear about how Deb deals with imposter syndrome and how she discovered her superpower and why you should discover yours too. You'll also hear about when Deb actually does her best work, and I think you may be surprised. This is a very poignant and informative conversation, and I hope you'll join me and lean in to hear what Deb has to share. But first, I would like to invite you to register you and your team for our upcoming Global Leadership Summit on August 3rd and 4th, 2023. Across two days, you will experience talks from leadership experts and also find encouragement and new perspectives so that you can lead where you are. I would love for you to come attend in our studio audience in South Barrington. You can also join us at a local streaming host site or online from the comfort of your own home or office. I hope you consider joining hundreds of thousands around the globe who consider this event to be deeply impactful in their leadership journey. Register today by visiting our site globalleadership.org summit. Also, if this is bringing value to your leadership, please remember to subscribe and rate. It helps other leaders find our podcast. And now, here's Dev and Paula. Deb, it's so great to kind of get away from the stage and come back here and get a chance to know you on a cellular level, a deeper level. Um, we have something in common, okay? We, you were raised in South Carolina, and I live in South Carolina now. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. So few people have been to South Carolina. Right. They always ask me, you know, what is it like? I'm like, well, it's south of North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I, I um, grew up, I was actually born in New York. And I moved down to South Carolina when I was six. Just outside of Charleston, yes. correct? Okay, so I'm upstate. So we're about four hours away. But talk a little bit about being a first generation um, American. You, Your parents immigrated here. Um, so talk a little bit about being an immigrant and first generation in America, in South Carolina, and what that was like for you. Well, I think it was also the cognitive dissonance. When I was, when um, my parents came to America, actually, they eventually settled in New York in this um, small place in Queens. So Queens, New York. And actually, my uncles and aunts all lived around us. We had family and friends everywhere around us. We spoke Cantonese everywhere. And then, you know, my dad faced discrimination at work. And one of his friends, who's Indian American, said, I moved down to South Carolina. Carolina. They don't, they don't, you know, the government does not discriminate. This would be a great place for us. And suddenly my dad picks up with my mom and we moved down to a state they've never been to. They, and they'd never been. They had never been. They oh didn't even gosh. know that much about it. And suddenly, you know, we're living in a place where no one looks like us. Yeah. Usually if you go to someplace new, like my grandparents immediately, they went to a place they'd never been, Flint, Michigan, but there was a large Arab population there and they were Lebanese. So that made sense, but there wasn't a large. They just knew that one family. And, oh you know, Lord. we were close friends with that Indian family for many years, but, you know, eventually they, they found other folks who were similar to them. But, you know, we lived in a small town that had mm. very few people like us. Mm. And I just remember just how different we felt. I had never felt different until I moved there. Really? And then every day people reminded me how different I was. I mean, people would come up to us in the streets and the mall, go back to where you came from. And I remember when I was little, I was thinking New York. They asked me to go back to New York because I'd love so to go back to New sorry. York. But then yeah. I realized that's not what they were talking about. And just this feeling of being the other all the time as a child, it's already very alienating when you're a child or a teen. But on top of that, feeling like you just don't belong. How did you get through that? How did your family family get through that? Just the, the different levels and layers of discrimination? Well, I think for my parents, it was really different because for them, what was the alternative, right? They, you know, in some ways this was their American dream. And so they said, you know, just ignore them. 
But for them, they owned, you know, a house. They they had like the exact American dream they wanted, but they had also grown up in different circumstances, right? My dad was telling us when he was, you know, when he got to America, he was struggling through college. He was trying to make money. I mean, they came with almost nothing. And he said, yeah, you know, for dinner, we would have milk and I'd pour milk into rice and that's all I could afford to eat. Oh and so for gosh. them, we yeah. lived, you know, in great riches compared to where we came from. And there were also people of faith. And so a lot of that was, they said, you know, we can belong here. And it, I struggled with that for a long time because even when I, um, we went to the first church we went to and it was a Baptist church, you know, they weren't accepted as members. And they were turned away as they members? They were turned away as members. Because of their nationality. And what nationality we, are you? We're Chinese American. Okay. And my parents immigrated here. They had, um, they had lived in Hong Kong before they came to America. And you know, when we went to this church, it was a place that, you know, we found a home in. There was only one other um, couple of color in, to, in that church. Um, they were they were black. And we just weren't accepted into that church when my parents raised their hand to be members. And so we became Presbyterian overnight. Um, and the Presbyterian mm. church, you know, down the street really embraced us. And we grew up in that church. And, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't know why we left that one church. And we asked our parents later and they explained it to us. And again, they explained it with very little anger or hurt, but I think it kind of made a mark on me, mm -hmm. which was even in church, you know, and I remember thinking, this is a church that sends missionaries to China, but couldn't in their midst have a family that didn't look like them. Oh my goodness. And there was only one other family of color. I don't know what their experience was like there, but I just remember thinking, maybe we just don't belong. And, you know, the, the new church we went to was an embracing church and, and we grew up and we spent the rest of our childhood there. So take me back to young Deb growing up in South Carolina. How did you figure out what you wanted to do with your life? Because you went and got your Bachelor of Science in Engineering at Duke, and then you go on to, to business school. So how, at, at what age did you know maybe what you wanted to do or who you wanted to be? You know, I wish I could say I had some grand plan and I didn't. <laughs> and I think intentionality is important. Like, you know, one of the things I think I kind of just said was, well, what's next, right? I knew I wanted to graduate and get a scholarship to college. So I said, if I work really hard, I'll get a scholarship to college. And then I said, I want to get an engineering degree because my father was an engineer and my sister is an engineer. So I got an engineering degree. And so, you know, then I said, what do I want to do next? And at the time, you know, consulting looked like a lot of fun. So I moved to Atlanta. I became a consultant, spent a couple years doing that. And from consulting, I went to Stanford because that's what a lot of consultants do. They right. get their MBA. So I did that. And I thought, okay, Stanford seemed like a great place. I'm going to mm -hmm. apply there. Got into Stanford, went to California. And then I said, what's next? And I graduated during a recession, you know, 2002, the dot-com bust had just happened and there wasn't a lot of jobs. And my husband uh, wanted to move back to North Carolina. And I said, if we can find jobs, let's go. And we just couldn't find a job. And I think in some ways, God blessed us because, you know, he had a job out there. He was a lawyer. You met your husband at Duke University where you, right? Is that correct? Yes, I, well, you I met, met your... him at church between, so he went to UNC and I went okay. to Duke. Yep. And we went to Raleigh. <gasps> wait, Trent. wait. Yes. Wait, he went to UNC yes. and you went to Duke. How do you make this marriage work? I know, right? Every year. We, so, you know, recently. A Tar Heel yes. and a Blue Devil Just remember who was, who was in the uh, Final Four, the right. Duke oh and UNC gosh. this year, Coach K's last year. And we actually, someone offered us tickets and I was like, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> well, marriage may not survive this. I know, it was so <laughs> stressful. I'm like, if UNC is going to beat Duke in the Final Four, they better win the whole thing. Mm -hmm, and then they lost sure. terribly. Mm -hmm. So that was... That was pretty disappointing. <laughs> Coach K's last run. Yes. But yeah, so we met at church, Neutral Grounds. That was actually in between, uh, you know, uh, in, it was in Raleigh. And so it was his parents' church that they helped found actually many years ago. And so, um, but yeah, we ended up in California. And then since I couldn't get a job, we couldn't go back. And so I ended up, you know, I, fa I saw this small startup, this table for PayPal. And at the time it was really small. And I said, okay, I use PayPal. PayPal. I can do this. And yes. so suddenly I'm working at PayPal. And we were bought, um, you know, right after I joined and I ended up doing the integration between the two sites, eBay and PayPal. And it was an incredible ride. Like I learned so much and I realized tech had so much power to make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. And it powered so, so many people said, you know, I have a business, like I, you know, I support my kids because I can sell on eBay and I can accept payments. And, and I realized that there was something really special about tech and I've spent the rest of my career in tech. Right. Do you feel a certain level of responsibility seeing as how, I mean, you're the CEO of Ancestry.com. Only 8% of Fortune 500 companies are women and less than 1% are women of color. Do you feel a certain level of responsibility? I remember the first time I was in a meeting with, um, there was this meeting I went to and it was, um, everyone was a vice president of the company, but me and my colleague who he's a black man and, and myself who's an Asian woman. And we were doing the work. So we were there to present the answer to this, this 
dilemma that we had. And we looked around and none of, nobody looked like us. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember afterwards talking to him about it and, you know, how strange it felt that every vice president was sitting there and they, none of them look like us, you know? And, um, and I asked my, I was talking to my coach about how different I felt there. And she said, yes, you know, they're, you're looking at them, but they're looking at you because you're in the room. Hmm. You and your friend, Ime, are in the room. And I just remember her saying that. And it really was a light bulb for me, which was, I can feel different. I can feel alienated or I can feel like, you know, I'm here, which mm-hmm. means someone else can be here mm-hmm. and the next person, the next person, because I could not be here. You know, the two of us could have not been there and the room would have looked even less diverse. Right. And so I decided to reframe that issue, which was instead of feeling like I'm the only one here, I think, you know what, I'm here, which means more people can come. You have dealt with imposter syndrome, which is remarkable to even believe that you have considering, you know, where you've been from PayPal to eBay and then you founded Facebook Marketplace and now you're here, you are the CEO of Ancestry.com. How have you reconciled imposter syndrome? Is this something that you have wrestled to the ground or do you still to this day, do you still struggle with it? I struggle with it every day. You know, I feel like, you know, why, why, you know, and I, I shared the story, which is, you know, when they asked me to interview for a CEO position at a public company, I said, why me? You know, and the, um, and the, you had to be asked to do I it. I had to be asked. Oh and my then, goodness, you know, Tom. I was like, I don't know if I want to, and the thing was Jim Citron, he's a Silicon Valley recruiter said, well, why not you? And I think that is such a powerful message, which is instead of asking us, why me? Have someone else prove to you? Because I was asking him to prove to me that I, was, I should do this. Instead, he's like, why not you? He's like, you tell me why I should exclude you. And I think that's such a huge reframing, right? That, you know, rather than saying, hey, I don't belong here. What if we said, you know, I do. And now the onus is on you to say, well, why don't, why, why would I feel like an imposter? Mm. I do think we do a disservice though to the kids as they're growing up, because the biggest disservice that we do is we really have, you know, we have this thing in school where there's things like class rank and test, their objective grades, there's SAT, there's just one thing after another, right? And it seems so obvious, like oh, who, who's the, the class rank? Who has the highest SAT score? Who got into the best school? Right, right. And you go into the workplace and someone is always better than you at something. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a comparison. This is no, there's like the, the panoply of skills that you need to exist mm-hmm. in and succeed in a workplace is so diverse. It's not getting the A on the test. It's not getting the 1600 in the SAT. And suddenly people who are type A are like, well, how do I win this game? And I realize it's not a game. You play your own game. You're not playing the same one. And so instead, what you say is, hey, if I can learn faster, if I could adapt more, if I can just build into my superpower, what is that special thing that makes me special? And what is the thing that I bring to the table? And how can I amplify that? Mm. And suddenly you are the best at one thing and you're okay not being the best at everything. Right. And you say that you're super power is listening, which is really incredible. I'm going to ask you some lightning round and then we're going to round, uh, I'm going to ask you some lightning round questions and then we're going to wind down the interview. Okay. okay? Um, are you a person of routine? Yes. Okay. Tell me a couple of the routines. Well, you know, for example, I work out every single day. Okay. And I started doing that when my daughter I was born because she would not sleep. She would, had colic. <laughs> and I would, the only thing that made her sleep was actually working out and the white noise of the sound machine. The, the machine. And so she would go, and then when she was about one and a half, she's like, mommy, I'm tired. It's time for you to go work out. It's time for you to go work so out. So now I had to work out every day and I did. <laughs> and I still do it since she's 10 now. Okay. And you have three children. They're how old? 16, 13, and 10. Oh, two teenagers. Joy. Enjoy your house. I love it. When do you do your best work? After the kids are in bed and the house is quiet. I make a cup of jasmine tea and I sit down with my computer and I just kind of, you know, let myself, I write actually as a way to think. Are you an early riser? Absolutely not. (laughs) <laughs> Thank God we have a successful leader that doesn't get up I, at four in the morning. I read about all these successful people like, oh yeah, you have to get up at 6 a.m. And I'm like, that is so not me. <laughs> oh, what time do you get up? Probably like usually about 20 minutes for my first meeting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, okay. I love that. Um, what have your children taught you? Patience. Okay. What do you hope your children learn from you? Resilience. What's the best leadership advice you've ever received? Be curious, not critical. What's the worst leadership advice you've ever received? Uh, um, To use disappointment as a tool. Oh, wow. Um, What are you excited about these days? 
I'm just excited about the opportunity that's ahead. You know, as we as we come out of COVID, I hope that we see the possibilities. I mean, it's exciting to start traveling again to see our families, but also to, we have a whole new world we're going into. Mm -hmm. If you had told us three years ago that all of us would be working from home, that we would stop traveling, that we would do all, like our routines are different. And I think that that opens the possibilities for change. I love that. What would you like to be, what would you like to be remembered for? That everyone who I touched in some ways had something positive to oh, come out of it. That's really, really beautiful. Last question for you, Deb. I um, mean, we ask everyone on the podcast this, one of the things that marks our community is curiosity. What's something that you are curious about? I'm curious about where the world is going to go as we as we continue to evolve. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the things that we've learned during COVID is that we're more resilient than we think, but we're also more fragile than we think. And I think, you know, looking at the next 10 years, 20 years, how, is this co how has COVID changed us? And how have we grown as a community and as, as a society? That's really great. I'm so glad you took the advice from that recruiter and asked yourself that question, why not me? Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations on being the CEO of Ancestry and all the wonderful things that you've done. And thank you for taking the time today, Deb. Thank you so much. What a great conversation between Deb and Paula. I'm so happy to see another leader who is not a morning person, although I would not be able to wake up 20 minutes before my first meeting. Deb has been in some very challenging situations and faced opposition on multiple levels, and it has not kept her down. Hearing her talk of the way she was treated as a child when she looked different is disheartening. At the same time, I was so encouraged by the way she was coached to reframe situations, to see a positive thing, what a positive thing it was that she's in the room, and that means that there is opportunity. I really liked that quote that she said, shared by Shirley Chisholm, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. What great advice if you are not at the table. But I have a question for the leader who is setting the table. Who is missing? So many great takeaways from this talk. Let's do what Deb says and build into our own superpower and keep getting better and bring that to the table. Be curious, not critical. A great way to invest in your curiosity is to sign up for the Global Leadership Summit. You can find more information at globalleadership.org or simply download the show notes for a direct link. You'll get to learn from amazing faculty while being surrounded by thousands of growth-minded leaders just like you. It's really an amazing experience. Thanks for listening to the Global Leadership Podcast. And until next time, we invite you to keep leading right where you are and keep getting better.